talk to you about some of the lessons I learned at CIA over my 32-year career there that saved my butt from really uh, some embarrassing mistakes, although I nevertheless made embarrassing mistakes while I was, I was at CIA, and I've entitled my talk Survival Heuristics. So just a little butterfides thing here. Uh, I did work at the CIA, I spent 32 years there as an analyst and as a manager of analysts, and here I am in only one of two possible countries. Which one is it? Afghanistan, I, I heard the F somewhere. And these two guys here are uh, uh, protecting me, and I've carefully cropped the photos so you can't figure out the plane number. And I spent 32 years there. I, uh, I worked on Southern Africa and the Middle East, and then I eventually became a, a, a poobah and hardly had to work at all. And uh, the, um, uh, as I go th went through my career, you know, I became less and less interested in any particular part of the world and much more interested in how we think. You know, how do we generate good ideas? How do we examine an issue comprehensively? And so I became really interested in that. And as a result, I sort of became a bit of a heretic at the CIA. Where all, I was thinking too much, right? And I was always suggesting different things that we could do and different approaches that we could take. In fact, when the internet reared its head uh, in the mid-1990s, I was the person at, at the CIA who was saying, you know, the internet is going to be big. It's going gonna, it's gonna to change the way all knowledge organizations do their work. In fact, it actually changed the way all organizations do their work. And at the time when I was arguing that in the mid-1990s, people uh, were not very receptive to it at the CIA. And I, I didn't realize, and this is something that I get into a little bit in my book, uh, Rebels at Work, that, uh, which was co-written actually with Lois Kelly, is that uh, when you're trying to make change in an organization, and this may have some uh, relevance to being a, a cybersecurity officer in a large organization, when you're trying to affect change in an organization, it's very difficult to do it if what you are presenting is a theological argument. So the internet is all about open information, right? At least it was in the 1990s. And the CIA is all about, right, closed information. And arguing the benefits of some, something that would promote openness and sharing of information to an organization that was so closed, I might as well have been like Martin Luther banging up the, the letters on the church in Wittenberg, right? That's how receptive they were. So some of the lessons about that are captured in the book Rebels at Work, um, which some of you, un, some unlucky people, I guess, are going to get today. So, but the rest of my talk I, that I really want to talk about are the lessons I learned about good thinking and avoiding the traps that lead to bad thinking. So are you good with that? Yeah? All right, let's go. So I'm just going to go through a, a few of the traps. Avoid the streetlight effect. Anyone uh, raise your hand if you have some idea of what I mean by the streetlight effect. There's a few, OK, but not, not many. So there's a joke. And the politically incorrect version of the joke is that there's a drunk at night on a sidewalk on his hands and knees. And the person doesn't have to be drunk, right? It's just something they threw in the story. And uh, a policeman finds him and says, or her, what are you doing? And the drunk says, I'm looking. I lost my car keys. I'm looking for my car keys. And the policeman says, is this where you lost them? The drunk says, no, but it's the only place I can see. Right? So that's the streetlight effect, where we as analysts treat the information that is in front of us, the streetlight, and act as if it accurately represents reality. And I have to say, and I'm ashamed to admit it, that I was well into my CIA career, probably 20 years into my CIA career, which gives you an idea of how effective their internal brainwashing is and or how not introspective they are, that I said, wait a minute, this information that reaches me through my inbox I don't actually know how accurately it represents reality. 
Actually, I don't know what share of reality it represents. Is it 5%? Is it 20%? I mean, if you think about it yourself as cyber threat analysts, how, if you were God and you were omniscient and you knew, you knew everything there is possible to know about cyber threat, now compare that to what you know, what percentage of everything that you should know do you know? But yet, you, you're forced to make decisions on that. You know, you have no choice but to make decisions on what you do know. But the only point here that I want to make is be humble about those decisions that you're making. Avoid the streetlight effect. Always realize that the information you have in front of you represents a slice and a kind of a flawed slice, because it's biased, too. And I won't get into that for the sake of time. Uh, uh, just represents a slice of reality. So one, avoid the streetlight effect. Trends are always, always, always about the past. I, I, I hate it when people presented an argument about the future based on trends of the past. Trends are composed of data points. And so, by definition, if it's a data point, it has to be about the past. So anyone know what this trend line represents, actually? It's a very famous trend line in American history. It's the trend line of the Great Depression. So the uh, first severe drop is uh, October 1929, when the stock market crashed. Notice that it began to go up after that. And a lot of people thought, oh, it's over. Everything's going to be fine. And then it just steadily plummeted down until I think the last point is maybe like 1936, 1937 on that line. So if at any point on that trend line, if you had based your decision on what had happened previously, you were likely to, to, to make a flawed decision. So what do I like to use instead of trends? Well, I'm, I'm a fan. OK, so first you have to use trends, right? You have to know what the past tells you. But if you know anything about probability, what happened a moment ago doesn't really affect what's going to happen next. It's a, it's a false construction that we have in our heads. And what I like to look at a lot are small indicators of change. I think the best way to observe the future is to observe the present very, very carefully. So when I travel, for example, I pay a lot of attention to graffiti. Graffiti is one of my favorite social indicators. Just the volume of graffiti in a particular city, like Madrid, for example, in Spain, tells you something about the social cohesion of that country. And I, from what I know about cyber threat intelligence, perhaps this is the point for me to confess that I don't know a lot about cyber. I didn't work on it in my uh, agency career. But from what I understand of the way these uh, malicious groups work, they, they do have a kind of graffiti. That, they, that, they, that exist, that they leave behind as they troll uh, companies and as they talk to each other about what they want to do next. So I like small indicators. I always I describe myself as an analyst of small things. And uh, kind of related, but a, a somewhat expanded category, are non-obvious indicators of whatever phenomenon that you're trying to look at. What, what can you see that is? Uh, not a direct indicator, but somehow travels with the phenomenon that you're trying to look at. But my bottom line is, don't depend on trends. Related, most things don't happen by chance. Now, you know, I've said this uh, before at other conferences, and I've been appropriately challenged by someone who points out that you do have things like random clustering. Correct. But we, you know, uh, how I really came upon this rule or uh, 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 thinking uh, trap to avoid is an analyst actually, when I was uh, reviewing his or her paper, actually wrote that X event in a country had happened by chance. And I, I pulled the analyst in and I said, well, what do you mean by the fact that this thing happened by chance? And the, you know, and the analyst was sort of hemming and hawing, and I realized that when we use the phrase, something happened by chance, what we're actually saying is that we do not understand the causality chain that led to this event. right? So when you say something happens by chance, 
you were saying, well, there's no way I could have known, so I'm therefore not responsible to try to figure out how I could know. If you replace that phrase with, I do not yet understand the causality chain, then, in fact, you are much more likely to work on trying to figure out why things that you didn't think were going to happen or that completely surprised you, in fact, did happen. So related to most things not happening by chance is this, uh, which is exponential causality. Now, I've scoured the internet looking for an image that could represent exponential causality. At this point, the grand taxonomy of rap names is what I've settled on. And if, if you Google that and look it up, you'll see that you know one rapper comes up with a uh, name, and all of a sudden, that influences a whole lot of other rappers, and then leads to a whole lot of other rappers, and this great universe of unusual names uh, emerges. Now, exponential causality is related to the notion of exponential functions, of course. And how many of you have read Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman? Required reading, I think, for a senior intelligence, uh, serious intelligence analyst. Uh, he, he makes the point that one of the reasons why humans are so bad at statistics, me, is because we're not very good at understanding exponential functions. But related to exponential functions, how something can go from like 3 to 15 uh, in one step, is uh, what I call exponential causality. So we tend to think linearly. Unfortunately, um, there's something that our education encourages us to do. And the way we look at facts encourages us to do. But we tend to think A leads to B, B leads to C, so forth and so on. But in reality, A leads to a multiple set of consequences. And each of those leads to another multiple set of consequences. And if you keep up on quantum theory, it's even argued that something in the future can affect the past and uh, affect the consequences of the thing in the past. So you're dealing with exponential causality, and you have to respect that. So, uh, and trend lines actually are a great example of uh, uh, something that we use a lot that doesn't take into account exponential causality. Are you all still with me? Yeah? OK. Worst case scenarios happen, OK? Now, I love this GIF. I will play it over and over again. Hopefully, it'll just, there it goes. My favorite thing about this GIF, or GIF, there's an, a controversy as to what you should say. If you look at it again, it's the car approaching the intersection. The driver, I love to imagine the driver in that car going, large red ball has appeared in front of me, you know, something he never prepared for. This is apparently a uh, Toledo art installation or something like that gone wrong, and the large rubber ball escaped. I, I don't think I can stop it unless I advance to the next slide, so we'll just let it, we'll just leave it like that. Anyway, so I learned this lesson when I started as a result of a conversation I had with a policymaker. And uh, bad stuff had begun to happen in the country. You might even imagine that country is Iraq, for example. And uh, there's a meeting with the policymaker, and the policymaker goes, you didn't warn me about this. And we say, well, we did. We told you this could happen. And the policymaker says, but you said that was a worst case. Interesting. So what, what was the policymaker doing? What was he assuming we meant when we said worst case? Unlikely. So policymakers often conflate the worst case scenario that you've painted, and, and think to themselves, oh, that must be unlikely. So one of the most important pieces of advice that I have to give you all, uh, particularly those of you who deal with decision makers in your company, and who have to convince them of the importance of a, of a security threat of one kind or another, that just because you say something is worst case doesn't mean that it's unlikely, and in fact, the probability of something occurring is independent from the consequences that that event may have, right? And it's human nature. You have to really fight this hard to equate worst case scenario thinking with unlikely. Completely different and can cause all sorts of uh, disconnects and communication issues with your customers. 
finally, we get to move on from that. Again, this is also about dealing with your customers. When you're explaining, you're losing. I think it was Ronald Reagan. I, when I Google this, uh, Ronald Reagan comes up uh, as the originator of this quote. If you're explaining, you're losing. But when we, as technical experts, present whatever our findings are, we tend to present them uh, with a lot of facts and uh, a lot of information. And we're doing that to a policymaker who wants simply to make a decision. And the very act of explaining, the more you go on, the more you drone on, I think the more you're losing, as a general rule, the person that you're trying to persuade. Uh, this is particularly true when an argument ensues. You say X, and the policymaker says, no, I don't believe X, Y is true. And then you start to explain why the policymaker is wrong. And you ain't getting anywhere there. So my advice to you, and I'll, I'll, we're going to talk a little bit more about best practices in a little while. But my advice to you when you're talking to a policymaker is that you need to have compelling stories and examples to make the point that you want to make and have those ready to go rather than another technical explanation. I don't know what the analogs and metaphors are in your domain, but you need to have those available so that you can present them rather than only rely upon explanation. So for example, a policymaker might say, well, do you have any evidence that this could happen? And you might not have any evidence, any hard evidence. And you could say, no, I don't. But you know, we want to avoid being like the drunk looking for his car keys only in the street light. There, you know, something that really makes the point without having to deal with a lot of technicalities. And finally, I think this is the final one of my traps, is you never run out of bullets. This is, a, a, again, I guess, another way to come at linear thinking. When I was, uh, and I think this might really apply to your domain, one of the lessons I learned, on, I learned early on from one of my first team chiefs, he had been working on Laos, I think, and he told me, you know, Carmen, I had it figured out. I had counted the number of bullets the Laotian guerrillas have, and I knew that on April 13th, they were going to run out of bullets. They weren't going to have any more bullets to fire. And my boss at the time said to me, John, you never run out of bullets, i.e., life happens, stuff happens, and they find a way to keep going. So when you think about what you're working on analytically, and you've got it like the whole linear train figured out, and you know that you know, on this day, the attack is going to end, or on that day, the attack is going to start, step back swallow a little bit of humility and realize that you never run out of bullets. Still with me? All right. I, I just like to check, you know. All right. Oh, uh, uh, one more. Speaking of bullets, I ruined my segue. Emotions can kill. Uh, you know, one of the, how, has anybody here ever worked at CIA, actually? I should have asked this question earlier. Oh, I see a couple of hands, yep. So one of the things that we did as analysts is we tried to be extremely objective. And we didn't want to have any kind of subjective issues in the, in, in, injected in our anal analysis. And again, as I went further into my career, I realized that that was mistaken because the world is made of humans. And humans are, of course, highly emotional. And we often would misjudge a situation or the severity of, a, of an outcome or what happened in Iraq, for example, or what's happening today in Afghanistan because we underestimated the emotional motivation that the actors had in the conflict. Now, I was thinking how this might apply to what you all do, and I, I, know, I, I, I understand that a lot of what happens in terms of uh, successful attacks on a system involve getting a human to click on a piece of clickbait that brings the virus or the malware into the system. And you, know, you can say to the human over and over again, don't click on attachments. But you know, if they love kitten pictures, and, 
and they are having a really bad day, the chances are heightened that they're going to click on that thing that appeals to us. And of course, there's this entire field of, let's see if I get it right, social cyber, social cyber security or uh, social cyber attacks where, in fact, and we saw some of this in the, in the 2016 elections and in the Brexit elections, where people who are trying to influence how you act or how you vote are very methodical in presenting information to you in a way that will appeal to you so that you will begin to believe or accept the story that they want you to accept. And all of that has emotional resonance. That's what they're appealing to. So emotions can kill, and emotions, if, you, if you're not in, in your, and how you're thinking about um, your cyber threat in, environment, taking into account emotions, um, you're underestimating your opponents. So I wonder a lot, for example, about how emotions might play in terms of how people perceive the US or whatever in terms of the different actors that might enter the cyber threat environment in the months and years to come. OK, now we're talking about survival strategies. Construct an analytic landscape. Now, that is actually my dryer underneath that little thing. I took a picture of it. And this is a landscape of the future of warfare that some analysts who were working for me 15 years ago built. What's interesting about this is it was an assignment where I said, OK, I, I want you all to step back from your day-to-day -day work, and I want you to think about every element involved in the future of warfare. And I gave them two rules, and I want you to build an analytic landscape of your issue. And they, and they said, what's an analytic landscape? And I said, I don't know, and I want you to build it. And I said, there's only two rules. You have to consult outsiders in building your landscape. In other words, it can't be just internal groupthink, and you have to present it graphically. I, want, I don't want us to be uh, kidnapped or held hostage by words, by, by text. I want you to present it. You can present it in text, but I also want you to present it graphically. So they built this using kind of a Delphi method where they asked people to rate uh, different aspects of the issue. They, uh, I don't know if I, laser. So the uh, spectrum of conflict was the bottom, so it's a 3D thing, and they go from like, you know, rock throwing to nuclear war. The, uh, let me see if I can see, what's the one on the side here? The, um, I can't read it. Adversary capability, of course, would go from low to high. And importance to the US or to whoever your actor went from low to high. And so you can imagine that this peak in the middle could conceivably have been North Korea. Nuclear warfare, mid-level capability, but highly important to the US. The point of this is, is not this particular landscape, although I, I think it's very cool and our customers loved it. The Navy wanted us to build a simulated version that their jets could fly through or something odd like that, right? But you know, it, it, it captured a reality about the future of warfare that you could not represent just with words. And it forced them to think about every aspect of it. Now, when you, you know, and what's important about this is that it helps you avoid the streetlight effect, right? You're only working on this because this is what you have the information on. By building an analytic landscape, another dimension that you could overlay on it is how well do we know each area? That, you know, you could have colored the mountain ranges by a color scheme that indicated I know, I, I feel confident about my information in this area, and I need to know a lot more about that area. And once you develop that analytic landscape, then you have a tool for shifting attention and for making sure uh, that you're not ignoring areas that could be important. And I should change this slide, and, and it should read, construct and revise. 
your analytic landscape. Because one of the problems with all these tools, because you know we're weak human beings, we're flawed. No matter what tool you hear about, you're going to use it as a crutch, right? And all of these tools have limitations. And they particularly have limitations if you overly rely on one or if you use the same anal an analytic landscape like for five years in a row. One of the things I learned about my analysts at CIA, or they're not mine, I don't own them, the analysts at CIA, was that you know, we had a, a program that brought our classified information into our inboxes based on uh, our areas of interest. And it was sort of like this Bayesian kind of thing, this and not this. And one day I asked the analyst, I said, how often have you revised your search query, the profile that brings the information into your inbox? What do you think I heard? Five years? Never. I didn't know you could revise it. I'm using the one the senior analyst gave me when I started eight years ago. I was, you know, it was apoplectic, but such a simple thing of such significance had long been overlooked. So construct and constantly revise your analytic landscapes. Apply a category system of some kind. Um, I actually think the first step in analysis is categorization. It's a necessary step, but can be a very dangerous step because we live and die by the categories we create. Now this is a very, a, my favorite first order categorization system. Who knows what this is? No? This is the Kneffen framework. Does that help? C-Y-N-E-F-I-N? No. Look it up, C-Y-N-E-F-I-N. It's a Welsh word, I think. There's so much information on this on, on the internet. But it's uh, a guy named David Snowden, no relation. And <laughs> he came up with this very simple heuristic device that your problem can fall into one, oops, sorry, went the wrong way. Your problem can fall into one of four spaces. It can be simple. So that's the problem where linear analysis really helps. It can be complicated. So it's still cause and effect, but there's a lot of causes and effects. So that it's uh, the famous Stalin quote that quantity has a quality all its own, right? So it just takes more time. Complicated problem sets are the ones where experts are really helpful. Like, you don't really ex need experts when it's simple. But experts can really help you when it's complicated. Complex is, with, is when cause and effect is unclear and generally cannot be determined in advance. Complex is the uh, problems are the, are the problem set that experts can fail you because they will apply confidently apply their expertise and be fooled by randomness. And then chaotic is where you never want to be, right? Chaotic is where there is seemingly no order. And often it happens when an existing system breaks down. And for a while, it's a free for all. And you're not really sure who, you know, what are the important causalities are going to emerge. I was thinking when I threw this up, where is cyber? And I, I OK, so correct me if I'm wrong. I, I sort of thought a lot of cyber threat intelligence might be complicated. In other words, that you sort of understand the causes and effects, but there's so many of them that they're very hard to keep track of. But then sometimes it'll kind of slosh over to complex. I don't know if anyone, uh, how many of you think it's complicated? I'll just have you raise your hands. Aha, how many of you think it's complex? OK, how many of you think it's chaotic? All right. OK, but anyway, it's, it's just an interesting thing to think about. And like, if you think about your domain uh, and maybe your particular company's profile, uh, then you could go, OK, you know, if it's simple, trends are OK. I can work with trends. If it's uh, complex, I better build myself out an analytic landscape. And because it's complex, I better revise it all the time. That's, that's, those are the ways I would use this very simple heuristic device. Know your thinking style. I know uh, who doesn't love Winnie the Pooh, oh, gosh. But uh, I know that uh, I heard in the introductions briefly a discussion about cognitive bias. And uh, we each have to know what our thinking style is. And uh, there are a few instruments on the internet 
Uh, I've used, uh, it's free, the Gregorc Thinking Inventory, G-R-E-G-O-R-C. It's very free and it, uh, it's free and it, it's simple and it, it says, it, it kind of puts you, are you, excuse me, are you uh, abstract or a concrete thinker or are you random or sequential? And um, I, I asked a group of intelligence analysts to take it once and they all ended up almost almost exclusively concrete sequential thinkers. So what that told them, and they were really a kind of upset about it, is that they're vulnerable to not seeing change. Because change, sudden change, is neither concrete nor sequential, correct? Right. So uh, understand your thinking style. And your thinking style, there's so many dimensions. I think that's why there's not a good test. But one, for example, is optimism versus pessimism. I'm an optimist by nature. I believe men, are men and women are basically good but feckless. But, you know, so they end up doing the wrong thing even though they had good intentions. And so I know that affects how I think about problems. I'm one of those who's likely to think that a worst case scenario is unlikely. And so just knowing that helps me uh, calibrate my thinking so I'm a little bit more effective. Find a thinking partner. Now, uh, because I'm, I'm kind of an optimist, my favorite thinking partner when I was at CIA was an Eeyore, a real pessimist. And we knew there was a disturbance in the force when she was optimistic about something and I was pessimistic about something. That was like a fascinating outcome to us, right? But do you have a thinking partner? Do you have more than one, really, a go-to uh, group of people that you can explore ideas with. Now, I, I took over, uh, I was part of the executive team that took over the analytic program at CIA after uh, WMD, 9-11, and the Iraq War. Uh, it was a trifecta. And um, we spent a lot of time introducing, and I'm sure you're familiar with this, structured analytic techniques. And of course, as I said earlier, when you introduce a new method, it tends to become a crutch. So everybody was into structured analytic techniques. And I, what I like to say is taking a walk around the block with your favorite thinking partner is as effective an analytic technique as anything you can do, right? So don't ignore the analog analytic techniques. And having a thinking partner is a, a very important one. Deploy diversity of thought. Now, you know, in certain domains, diversity of thought becomes harder because your domain does not attract a full range of thinking styles. At CIA, for example, we had 100,000 plus resumes every year. But I worried that they did not represent uh, thinkers who were very creative or who were radical in their approach. I worried that the only people who would have put their resume in for the CIA would be people who sort of saw the world in black and white and didn't see a lot of gray or a lot of color. And I think that your domain is a similar domain where you have an attraction bias, right? Where the people who come are self-selecting themselves away. When I would go to universities, I would tell the audience that I was talking to, the people that I really want to see apply are the ones who think they could never work at CIA. You're the people I most want, and I, I, I rarely got them. So deploy diversity of thought. I have a whole other talk about diversity of thought and, and ways to think about diversity of thought. I'm curious, how many of you manage other people? Ah, a lot of you, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this for a couple of minutes. Uh, first, diversity of thought is important, and, and having and organizations that, that allow for a lot of different ideas have better outcomes even when the dissenters are wrong. Right? So even when the people who are expressing a different view are wrong, the organization still has better outcomes. And the reason is because allowing for free-flowing debate leads everyone to raise their game. The people that have the majority point of view or the majority opinion, uh, they work harder when they know that their team has vibrant debate. So diversity of thought, and it's, you know, it, it, it is important uh, 
leads to better outcomes, particularly the more complex the tasks, the, tasks, the more important diversity of thought is, and um, contributes even when the dissenters are wrong. So the literature shows that very clearly. The second point I want to make about diversity of thought to your managers is that it's very hard to manage diversity of thought, and none of you have been taught how to do it. Most organizations want the organization to run smoothly, right? When I was a manager, like it, people would say, oh, you never hear any problems from Carmen's team, A-OK. -okay. But that's not necessarily a good indicator. Because if you're going to encourage the diversity of thought, your team is going to be crunchy, right? There's going to be differences of opinion, and you're not, you, you, you haven't been taught how to do that. I don't know of any management program that actually helps managers manage differences of opinion effectively. And not only do you have to manage differences of opinion, you have to conduct yourself so that your team members know that you welcome their, their opinion. So a couple of points there. Very popular today in organizations is the stand-up meeting. Or the or five or 10 minutes, stand up, that's it, we're done. When you as a manager only have a five to 10 minute, what are you telling your reports? That it better be really important for them to mention it, because clearly, this 10 minute uh, limit on the meeting is very important to the manager, right? So the way you conduct yourself uh, helps or depresses diversity of thought in an organization. Another thing that's very common for people, managers to do is to talk for 45 minutes, which I'm uh, about to do, and, uh, and then say any comments. What happens when you talk most of the time in the meeting and then you say any comments? What do you get? You get crickets, right? The any comments is a sign that the meeting is over. So what could you say instead? As a manager, what did I get wrong? How would you do it differently? What did I miss? Or even, why don't you set the agenda for the meeting next time and I'll sit in the audience, right? So I could talk way too much time, spend too much time on this. But as a manager, the way you conduct yourself, both physically and with your words, has a lot to do with diversity, whether or not you're able to operationalize diversity of thought. Think together from the start. OK, so you've got diversity of thought. You've got different people in your group. And then often what happens is that uh, you don't actually incorporate the other viewpoints until later in the process. So when you collaborate toward the end of the process, you're not collaborating at all. What you're doing is deconflicting, right? Collaboration must occur from the beginning. When you're close to the end of whatever you're doing, the last thing you want is someone else's opinion to derail you and make you start again from alpha. So when you collaborate and you deploy diversity of thought, do it from the beginning of your project. Think together from the start. And finally, respect your intuition. So, you know, we talk a lot about method, but your brain has a way of revealing to you things without articulating it to your consciousness. And I'm going to give you an example. I've never actually said this in public before because I think it's a little, I don't know. Well, you, you, you'll tell. You can, you'll decide, right? But uh, over the years, you know, as I drive around, I'm always observing, you know, looking. And uh, I've noticed, and so I'll be driving and overtaking the pedestrian who's walking. And as I overtake that pedestrian, the thought will enter my mind, oh, that person is Asian. And then I'll go past them and I'll look in my rearview mirror and they're Asian. You know, they're Japanese or Chinese or Korean. And every time I'm right, I think I'm batting like a six sigma number on that. I may have, you know, many, I may have been mistaken once. And this is over many, many years. It's been at least 10 years since I noticed that phenomenon. To this day, I don't know what it is I'm noticing. I, 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 I don't know, and I'm not gonna Google, you know, the first, I don't even know what to Google, right? So I'm, I'm driving along, winter or summer, I notice a person walking along, and it, you know, and I go, I think that person is Asian. And I, I think that it has to do, I don't know, with the way their head and their shoulders or something 
relate to each other. But whatever it is, I can't articulate it. So my brain has noticed something that I'm not consciously able to explain. That's what intuition is. You know, intuition is what I think, and at least intuition as it, as it applies to what we're talking about. Intuition is when your, your brain has picked up on something visually, because you know your brain is best at visual processing, that it can't figure out the text to explain it to you. And so I think it's always important to respect that as well. And I hope that you feel like this dog, uh, happy and content. Thank you very much for your attention.